uh, many a Jewish person living in diaspora, living in diaspora means you're living outside of Israel, they will observe a second Passover meal tonight. For Jews, Passover is a great festive celebration. Why? Because Passover is a God-ordained feast that reminds the people of God how they were miraculously, I would say supernaturally, delivered out of Egypt from a life, listen, a life full of cruel, harsh slavery. That's why the Jews celebrate when I say Jews, your Orthodox Jews, your conservative Jews, and yes, even your uh, Reformed Jews. That's why they are celebrating Passover, because they are reminding themselves how God delivered them from 400 years of slavery. Newsflash. The Bible has always been against slavery. Amen. Just remember that. That's what Passover is all about. When Jesus officially announced himself as the Messiah in the, in when he was 30 years old, and having been baptized in, by John the Baptist in the Jordan River, he went to the synagogue. And on the day he went to the synagogue, he picked up the scroll from the Sabbath reading. And on the day that he was in the synagogue, they had been reading the scroll of Isaiah. And he picked it up. It was given to him to read. And he read Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. That's a statement by the future Messiah, if you will. And in Isaiah 61, 1 and 2, it says, The Messiah has come to set the captive free, to set at liberty those who are bound. The Bible has always been against slavery. Amen. And here, the Jews are celebrating that victory that God Got them out of Egypt. Um, God wants Israel. He wanted Israel to do the Passover because he wanted them to be reminded of the cost of redemption. The cost of redemption. That's Deuteronomy 7 verse 8. Now, under the new covenant, as Pastor Steve alluded to, today we Christians are not living under the Mosaic covenant. We're living under the new covenant that Jesus established on the cross of Calvary. Amen. We Christians today are not commanded. This is a Jewish feast. This is not the Lord's Supper. This is not communion. This is a Jewish feast. We Christians, though, living under the new covenant, are not commanded to observe Passover. But we do honor and respect Passover because Jesus still loves Passover, Amen. and it is he who gave us the ultimate meaning of Passover. Um, interestingly, in the four New Testament Gospels, the Passover that Jesus attended is alluded to, is described. Remember, Christian, Jesus was born a Jew yes. in the land of Israel of the tribe of Judah, and he was raised in a Torah observant home. How do we know that? Because Pastor Steve alluded to it in Luke chapter 2, verse 41. Joseph and Mary were Torah observant. Yes, Jesus, while on this earth, was a Torah observant Jew. He was. Yes. He pointed to the Sad uh, Sadducees and the Pharisees. Which of you can, can, can say that I've never kept the law? He was Torah observant. That means, friend, when I say Jesus was Torah observant, he kept the moral tenets of the Ten Commandments. He obeyed its civil commands. And he observed all the Levitical festival feasts. In that sense, he was a Torah observant Jew. Jesus was indeed, was indeed raised, we could say, a kosher Jewish person. Interestingly now, 
in all four New Testament Gospels, they all record our Lord's last Passover, or we would say Seder, meal. All four New Testament Gospels do that. Of the four, I was praying up here when my brother was introducing me, stay out of Luke. <laughs> stay out of Luke. Don't go there. And then when he said Luke 22, I said, Lord, keep him out of there because that's where I'm going. But look, <laughs> that was funny. That was funny. Uh, of the four gospel accounts of Jesus' last or Passover Seder, Luke's account is my favorite. It's my favorite account of his Seder meal. Why? Well, let's turn to Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22, and I'll tell you why Luke's narrative, his account of Jesus' last Passover meal, is my favorite account. Luke chapter 22, and let's just begin in verse 7. Cheer up, I'm not as long-winded as my brother Steve. Hey. Amen? <laughs> okay. <clears throat> verse 7. Then came the day of unleavened bread, when the Passover must be killed. Let me just add this footnote. If you go to Leviticus chapter 23, you will see where God made a distinction between the feast of Passover and the seven-day feast of unleavened bread. Obviously, the seven-day of unleavened bread followed right on the heels of Passover. But the Jews in Jesus' day counted those two feasts as one. They would call the Feast of Unleavened Bread Passover and vice versa. They would address Passover as the Feast of Unleavened Bread. They called it as one. So verse 7, then came the day of unleavened bread when the Passover must be killed. And he, that is Jesus, sent Peter and John saying, go and prepare us the Passover that we may eat. This is funny, ladies. On Passover, it's the woman's job to prepare the feast the Passover meal, to set everything up, and most of all, to clean the house of leaven. Because remember, you're going to have a week of unleavened bread. Jews cannot have leaven in their house during this week. So it's usually the woman's job to clean the house of leaven. Here the Lord Jesus told two men to do one woman's job. Amen? Can I hear an amen from the women today? Okay, so look, it says, and he sent... Peter and John say, go and prepare us the Passover that we may eat. And they said unto him, where wilt thou that we prepare? And he said unto them, behold, when you are entered into the city, there shall a man meet you bearing a pitcher of water. It was unusual for a man to bear a pitcher of water. Usually that was women doing it. Isn't that interesting? Bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house where he entereth in. And you shall say unto the goodman of the house, The master saith unto thee, Where is the guest chamber where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? And he shall show you a large upper room, furnished, there make ready. And they went and found as he had said unto them, and they made ready the Passover. And when the hour was come, he sat down, and the twelve apostles with him. And he said unto them, with desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not eat any more thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup. We're going to go over some cups today. He took the cup and gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took bread and gave thanks and brake it and gave unto them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament or the new covenant. In my blood, which is shed for you. Again, of the four <clears throat> Gospels accounts, only Luke's account, and this is important, only Luke's account of Jesus' last Passover meal 
records or describes or we could say highlights uh, Jesus' emotional feelings concerning this final meal. Only Luke does that. He describes our Lord's emotional feelings. Read again verse, for this, verse 15. And he said unto them, With desire I have desired to eat this Passover. The words desire and desire describe a strong emotional reaction. The word used in the Greek for what we have translated into the English as desire, it denotes a strong longing, craving, or yearning. Uh, have you ever been, maybe you've been in the armed services, you've been overseas, or maybe you've been on a business trip of some kind, it's taking you away from your home, and you've been overseas, and it gets to the point where you're across the pond or whatever, and you just long to come back home. I was in Korea for a while, and I headed up to here with kimchi, and I just longed to come back home and eat a hamburger. Amen? I just wanted, I just craved to get in my own bed and be with my own family. That was that longing, that craving. That's the emotional makeup that this word is describing, describing about the Lord Jesus. Um, Christian, Luke did not use this particular word frivolously or flippantly. Amen. No, Luke was directed by the Holy Ghost to use such a word to convey Jesus' emotional being at this time. We should take note of that. Um, Passover... <coughs> The three previous Passovers, or the last two Passovers that Jesus had observed, was, was different than this one. On this one, he, his emotions were raw and openly expressive, according to Luke. That's important for you and I to take note. Why was he emotionally charged at this last Passover? Why? Why was Jesus so emotionally charged on this last Passover? Well, I'm going to tell you at the end of my message. Remind me not to forget to tell you, all right? I'm getting old. I start forgetting. So, uh, so as you see here, before we go back to, come back to Luke chapter 22, we have here the Passover Seder uh, set up. And uh, before we describe the symbolism of the elements of Passover, uh, let's... Um, Let's go to where the original Passover is mentioned in Scripture. Turn to Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12. Before we describe the foods of Passover and their meaning, let's go to the original Passover. Found in Exodus chapter 12. And before we read a few verses out of Exodus 12, Christian. Now, I'm a goy. Goy in Hebrew means Gentile. I, I am not Jewish. Uh, I, I will only wear the yarmulke when I'm doing the Passover because I want people to relate to the Passover. But I'm a, I'm a Gentile who loves Jews. But Christian, may, may I encourage you to do this. If you have Jewish friends and they invite you to a Passover meal, go! Amen. Go to it. Go and observe how Jews today observe Passover. It's not only fascinating to watch, but in going, you'll observe much of what the Lord Jesus and his disciples did on Passover evening. Friend, this meal has not changed that much in 2,000 years. That's why I love presenting the Passover to Christian churches. Because you get to see things that Jesus and his disciples did on that Passover night. Uh, so, so go uh, when they go. So again, let's look now at the original setting of Passover. Uh, it's in Exodus chapter 12, so let's just read verses 1 through 13. Exodus 12, verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, 
say, this month shall be unto you the beginning of months. The month here is April. Jews have two new years. April is their religious new year. It says, this month shall be unto you the beginning of months. April is their religious new year. September, when they have uh, uh, the blowing of the trumps, that's their civil new year, okay? So, but here in verse 2, this month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak unto all the congregation of Israel, saying in the tenth day of this month, they shall take to them every man a lamb. Now, just so you know, during this time, there's probably around 2.4 million Jews living in Egypt, all right, under Moses. 2.4 million. Where do we get that word? Well, we do know when Israel left Egypt, the Bible specifically says there were 600,000 men. 600,000 men. And then it says, besides women and children, average family is four. So if you multiply 600,000 times four, you'll get a number around 2.4 million people. All right? So just so on this Passover night, word's going to be traveling fast, right? Without text, without Instagram. Okay? So look, speak unto all, verse 3, speak unto all the congregation of Israel, saying in the 10th day of this month, they shall take to them every man a lamb according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. And if the household be too, too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it up until the 14th day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill, and it's something the King James says, kill it in a singular sense. Although there were thousands of lambs slain that Passover evening, God saw it as one lamb being slain. You shall kill it. Verse 7, and you shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the houses wherein you shall eat it. And you shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread. Unleavened bread is bread without yeast. It's a cracker, if you will. We'll look at it in a minute. And with bitter herbs, and you shall eat it. You eat not of it raw nor sodden at all with water. But roast with fire, his head with his legs, and the pertinence thereof. And you shall not let nothing of it remain until the morning. And that which remaineth of it until the morning, you shall burn with fire. And thus shall you eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand. You shall eat it with haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I, I love verse 12. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, against all the gods of Egypt. I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Verse 13. And the blood, the blood of the Lamb, shall be to you for a token, a sign, upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. The original Passover was connected to the 10th and final plague God was going to bring upon Pharaoh and Egypt for refusing to allow Moses and the Hebrew children to leave Egypt and worship the Lord their God. That's why God was going to bring this 10th and final plague because Pharaoh refused to allow Moses and the children, the Hebrew children, to leave Egypt and worship their own God. Please understand this, friend. This tenth plague was the plague 
of death. The plague of death. It was the plague of death upon all. The firstborn of man and beast. Why? Why was God going to kill all the firstborn in Egypt on Passover night? Does anyone here know, other than Steve, Pastor Steve? The reason God was going to slay all the firstborn of man and beast is because the Egyptians worshipped the firstborn of man and beast. They deified the firstborn of man. And did you see what God said in verse 12? Let's read it again. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. What does it say? And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. Amen. I am the Lord. Friend, God turned the Nile to blood because the Egyptians worshipped the Nile. That's right. God gave Israel, uh, Egypt an abundance of frogs Amen. because they worshipped the frog. Could you imagine, ladies, going into the bathroom, opening your countertop, and out come frogs? Can you imagine going into the restroom and lifting up the toilet and it's croaking? Could you imagine opening your refrigerator and there are dead frogs everywhere? God said, okay, you worship the frog, I'll give you an abundance of frogs. They, they worship the sun god, Ra. So God said, okay, I'll turn the sun to darkness. In other words, what God was doing in these ten plagues was systematically telling Egypt, I, the Lord, am greater than all gods, Amen. even Amen. your gods. Amen. So they worship the firstborn. So God said, I will attack your God. But God is a God of love. Yes. He is a God of mercy. Amen. Yes. He did say, there is a way yes. you can be delivered. Amen. You can put the blood of the lamb on your mezuzah door frame. Put the blood of the lamb on the door frame, and when I see it, I will pass over you. That's what the word pass over means, to pass over. So here's something interesting we share with our Jewish friends. Just being Jewish, just being a child of Abraham did not make you invulnerable or invincible to God's judgment. No, even being a Jew, you had to put the blood of the lamb on the doorpost of your house to escape the wrath of the death angel that night. Please remember that. God provided a way for everyone to escape judgment. Yes. But they had to do as he commanded. Amen. So uh, tonight, by the way, I want to make, make sure you understand. On that original Passover night, there was no deliverance, no salvation from the judgment of God apart from applying the blood of the lamb to the doorpost of your house. You're right. Amen. You didn't put the blood, the death angel visited your house. Now, let's look over the elements, okay? I'm going to speak loud so uh, you'll be able to hear me. I don't know if I can carry this thing with me or not. I think I, um, You can carry the mic if you'd sure. like. Okay. I don't know how far the, the, the That's sword far. will reach. Ah, you can hear me. I'll use my law enforcement voice, okay? How's that? <laughs> so, I have my yarmulke on. It's not a beanie. It's a yarmulke or a skull cap. Why do Jews wear a skull cap? It's your observant Jews. Why do they wear it? Now, I've had Jewish men tell me I wear the yarmulke because it reminds me that God is watching over me. Okay. Some Jewish people will wear the men will wear the yarmulke to remind people of their identity. All right. They're proud to be of, of Abraham's ancestry. Uh, when it comes to Passover, we have female yarmulkes that we will. You have all type of ornament yarmulkes. You can even have your favorite college football team. Now, I'm just saying. I'm not saying the Hurricanes are my favorite college football team, but you can get that, all right? 
I went to a church in Florida to do the Passover, and I wore my Miami Hurricane yarmulke. Amen. And they were all gators. <laughs> I didn't get a love offering from them. I'm telling you that much right now. But oh well, praise God. Now look, we have the prayer shawl. I know if you watch the news, and you'll see Jews uh, put this prayer shawl on. Um, it's an ornate uh, prayer shawl. And it's got its seats seat on the backs of knots on there that have specific religious meanings. But you have the gold and the blue representing Israel and, and deity and everything. They will put this on for the ceremony. You'll see the Jews at the Wailing Wall. They'll go like this. And they'll be praying like this. They'll have their phylacteries on. Um, the father or the grandfather will put this ceremonial garment on for Passover. We have four cups of wine. It, it can be argued there were four cups of wine at Jesus' Passover. Because he took several cups in the passage of Luke 22. We'll look, I'll point that out in a minute. But uh, you have, they each have a significance, cup of sanctification. God has separated the Jews unto himself as a nation. Yes. You have the uh, cup of blessing, uh, the Abrahamic blessing, Genesis 12, 3. I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. That's what the second cup stands for. In, if, in an interesting frame, the third cup is the cup of judgment, the cup of death. And we'll come back to that. And then, and then you have the cup of communion. All right, Jesus said, I will not drink any further of the fruit of this vine until I drink it anew with you in the kingdom of heaven. Um, now, ladies, I did not say this, but Judaism will say this. When it comes to Passover, the ladies get to open up the service by lighting the candles. Uh, Judaism will say, Eve cast the world into darkness, therefore we ask the woman to come and light the candles and bring light back into the world. So they'll have the ladies do the candle, lighting of the candle. At Passover tables, they have a lamb's bone. They don't have a lamb like the original one. Why? Because they don't have a temple that they can sacrifice a lamb at. Observant Jews know the only place they could slay a lamb today is where God said you could only slay a lamb. That's in Jerusalem. In Jerusalem, they don't have a temple. So today they just have a lamb's bone reminding them. Uh, you'll have a uh, dish of, of lettuce, carpus, uh, this. I, I, I've seen different meanings. This is also horseradish. Um, horseradish will make you cry. And so you take horseradish, you'll start tearing up and running nose and everything, obviously, and you have this. This is, a, a lot of them will say the carpus. Some will say this is representative of the hyssop. You know, they were told to put the hyssop in the blood and then paint the door frames. Some will say the lettuce is that. Uh, the horseradish is for the bitter bondage, the bitter herbs. All right, so that's why they have that. You have uh, over here the hiroshi. This is a mixture of nuts, dates, cinnamon, and honey. It reminds the Jews of the servitude in Egypt. When they pass these elements to each family member, each family member will get a little bit of the Horoshet. And they're reminding themselves that our ancestors were, were slaves. And they were forced to make mortar walls. You know, when I was in Egypt, uh, we saw, according to the Egyptologists, not Christians, not Christian Egyptians, but Egyptologists, they showed us an ancient mortar, brick mortar wall that was very ancient, several thousand years old. Now, we're not saying that that mortar, brick mortar wall was made by the Israelites, but what it is saying is Egyptians didn't make foreigners make walls out of mud and everything. So it does relate to the Bible. So they'll do this to remind themselves of their servitude. They have eggs. Um, some will say the eggs represent the eyes. They will take the egg and dip it in salt water, reminding themselves of the servitude to Pharaoh. Um, this is an ornate Seder plate that they will have. I'm just using it for display. Before I talk about the matzah, we have an empty chair. Our family's going to come up here a moment, and we'll just briefly go through. We're going to do an abbreviated version. You know, Passover can last up to six hours. If a Jewish person does invite you to go to Passover, just remind them. You know, i got to be somewhere at such and such a time, okay? It can last up to six hours. I've been to a 
Jewish Seder service. It was made up of senior citizens, and they called it the 30-minute Passover. That's all they could stand, 30 minutes, and they went home. All right? So that's the one I like you to go to, okay? We're going to do an abbreviated version. But look, we have an empty chair. Do you know why they have an empty chair? Every Passover table will have the family, and then they'll have an empty chair. It's for Elijah. They know the promise of Malachi, that Elijah will come before the great notable day of the Lord. So they're hoping on Passover night that Elijah will knock on their house door and come observe Passover with them. So they always leave a table for it, or chair for Elijah. And of course, uh, the most important thing, we have the matzah tash. This is an ornamental uh, pocket where they put their matzah bread. It's, it's amazing. Listen, Christian. This is the matzah tash. It has three compartments. It's where they will have the three loaves of matzah. Friend, they've been doing this for 2,000 years. The Jews today still do it. They have three matzah loaves. Oh, I just broke one. They have three matzah loaves. You ask the Jewish people, why do you have three matzah loaves? They'll all have a, you know, an opinion, but no one knows for sure. Isn't it amazing? On Passover, Jews who are not Christians, they don't believe Jesus is the Messiah. They'll take the three matzo loaves, and they'll always take the second matzo loaf. I'm going to take the second one while I'm breaking all of them. But look, they'll always take the second matzo loaf mm. and break it. Now, it is something. The matzo tosh is kind of referred to as the unity. <laughs> they have a unity cloth with three matzo loaves. Mm. Now, you ask the Jews, what do the three matzo loaves represent? Some will say Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Some will say Levites, priests, and Kohens. Jesus said, this bread represents my body. And isn't it amazing? They've always been taking the second loaf. Amen. And they break the second loaf. Jesus, no doubt, on Passover night, took the second loaf yes. and broke it. And so... Um,